you are watching Unsafe Space. Please don't forget to support the channel by going to subscribestar.com slash unsafe space. How an Economy Grows and Why It Doesn't by Erwin A. Schiff. Now you may have seen versions of this video floating around the internet, but my daughter encouraged me to re-record one because she doesn't like the versions that are out there. It's very boring. I would listen to it. It would be cool, but <clears throat> yeah, no humor at all. All right, so hopefully I'll do a better job reading. If you are Peter Schiff and want this removed, just contact me. But you've got other copies out there, so I assume that you don't mind. Here we go. How an Economy Grows and Why It Doesn't by Erwin A. Schiff. In How an Economy Grows and Why It Doesn't, Erwin Schiff, America's leading expert on the federal income tax, presents economics in his thoroughly informative, yet always entertaining manner, proving that the only thing dismal about the dismal science must be those who normally teach and write about it. Without a doubt, anyone reading Schiff's hilarious allegory will have a far better understanding of economics than many who have pursued the subject full-time at our nation's universities. Maybe we should dedicate this reading to Carrie. Yeah, maybe this will help her learn economics without her eyes glazing over. Good point. Good point. Wait, I just want to say something, by the way. So, like, the... It's not hilarious, the way it's recorded. I, I don't mean offense to um, the person who was recording it, but it's just no emotion. And a lot of the, like, things in the word bubbles, that's like, ex exclamations, like, yikes! And yeah, it's not in there. It's just... All right, well, we'll try and do a better job. <laughs> yeah, I'm going right. to poke you if you don't. A fish story. Once upon an island lived three men who fished for food every day. I'm Abel. I'm Baker. And I'm Charlie. Ugh. Fishing by hand is no bucket of bass. It's harder than eating soup with a fork. But after much trouble, they each managed to catch one fish per day. And every day, Abel, Baker, and Charlie consumed the fish each had caught, enabling them to survive to the next day to catch another fish. Another day, another fish. <coughs> this is survival, and that's about all. Everything that is produced is consumed. And so, in this super simple island society, there are no savings, no credit, no investment. One night, looking up into the star-studded sky, Abel is struck by a thought. There must be more to life than catch, eat, and catch. There is. His think box started grinding, and the idea for a fish catcher is born. I'll call it a net. So, the next day... What? You're not going fishing today, Abel? You'll go hungry! I need net materials. Abel is living out a few very basic economic principles in order to improve his way of life. He is under-consuming, and he is taking a risk. I'm giving up something. Eating. It might not even work. At the day's end, Abel has completed his net. He has created capital through his self-sacrifice. While Abel can't sleep for hunger and worry about his risk-taking experiment, his friends snooze contentedly toward a new day of hand fishing. The next day, Baker and Charlie make much sport of Abel's invention. You could wear it like a hat. You could tie it in a bow. Ho, ho. I'm going fishing. You'll see. The laughs soon fade to gasps. <gasps> he caught one already. Bravo. It works just as I'd planned. And by the day's end, 
Abel has caught two fish. Baker and Charlie each the usual. I'm dead tired, too. Now I have more fish than I need to consume. I have generated savings. Abel's savings create capital. Since the island society had no store of savings, the island's first piece of capital equipment was derived solely from Abel's willingness to deny himself food for one day. Now I don't have to spend every day fishing. Now I have time to build a better shelter, make tools, and till the soil. Without a supply of savings, capital, an economy cannot grow. Baker and Charlie soon realize that they too could benefit from Abel's net, his capital. Hey, Abel, old buddy-buddy, let us borrow your net, huh? But Abel is nobody's fool. He remembers his self-sacrifice, hunger, risk. Nothing doing. Make your own net, buddy buddies. Huh? But, but we can't stand to be hungry. Not everybody is cut out for self-deprivation. Besides, we're all thumbs when it comes to handcraft. We might starve to death before we can make a decent net. So how about this? Loan us some of your surplus fish to eat while we make a net. We'll repay you from our net catches. Oh yeah, then if you fail, I've lost my savings. I'd have everything to lose and nothing to gain by making such a loan. He's got a point. A straight loan is no incentive for him. Baker and Charlie's think boxes mesh gears, and a financial idea is born. Interest. Hey, Abel, hear this. For every fish you loan to us while we build a net, we'll pay back two fish. Now that interests me. If I loan them four fish, I'll get back eight fish. I'll be four fish richer without doing any more work. Two-way benefits. But it's not only Abel the capitalist who gains. This deal really won't cost us anything, Charlie. Yes, we can use Abel's capital without any personal sacrifice, like going hungry. With the four fish we borrow, we can eat while building our nets. And with our daily catch doubled, we can soon repay the four fish loan plus four fish interest to Abel. It'll really cost us nothing, because we'll pay off Abel out of our increased productivity, thanks to his savings. We'll be much better off, and soon we'll have capital savings to loan out, too. Abel's savings options. 1. He simply might hold on to his savings for possible future emergency use. But, of course, then they wouldn't grow. Once smoked, they don't spoil. I might want to eat them if I'm ever sick or something happens. 2. He could indulge himself and consume all his savings. Man, what a pig out. 3. He could loan out his four fish to Baker and Charlie and get back eight fish if they succeeded in building nets. If they fail, I've lost my savings. Risk rears its ugly head. 4. But still another possibility struck Abel. Instead of loaning fish, consumption goods, to Baker and Charlie to sustain themselves while they build a net, a capital good, why not use the fish myself? I'll consume one fish per day for two days while I build two more nets. Then I'll still have two fish and I'll own three nets. Next, I can rent a net to Baker and Charlie for a half a fish per day, a reasonable fee. Baker and Charlie will each be able to catch two fish per day with the nets. Since I would have caught one fish without the net and subtracting a half a fish rent, I'm now one half fish richer. It beats the hard work of hand fishing, whereby I can catch only one fish per day, 
and I can retire and never work again with 30 fish per month rental fees coming in. It beats loaning four fish to Baker and Charlie to build their own nets. That would have earned me a total of only four fish. Of course, Baker and Charlie might only rent the nets for two days, then use their savings to build nets for themselves. I'd only be two fish ahead. What to do? Loan out four fish so Baker and Charlie can build their own nets and get eight fish back? Or eat two of my fish while building two more nets for rental that might bring back only two fish, but possibly steady retirement earnings? Decisions, decisions. But no matter which way he goes, if Baker and Charlie are successful, Abel will have increased his and society's capital. Review Abel and society has only five things he can do with his savings gained by self-sacrifice. One, he can save what he has saved. Two, he can consume what he has saved. Three, he can loan out what he has saved. We've got food. Let's take a day to build nets. Four, he can invest what he has saved. Five, or he can try a combination of all four choices. Whatever Abel does, it will be based upon the relative risk and profit rewards and his personal economic needs. We'll tell you what to do with your capital, Abel. Hmm? Loan it out for low, low interest. How about charity? Divvy up. Or how about this? Oh, no, you don't. I'm the only one who stands to lose directly if my savings are wasted. Moral right. So only Abel has the moral and equitable right to decide how to use his property. Whatever choice Abel makes eventually will enable the community to generate three extra fish per day, assuming they all continue to work just as hard. What about greed? Won't it be bad if Abel turns out to be a greedy guy wanting more and more wealth? Bad for who? The only way Abel's wealth can increase is if he makes his wealth available to other members of the community. Otherwise, his wealth will stay the same or get smaller as he personally uses it up. The noble thing about private capitalism is that it forces those who may only be motivated by personal gain to raise the standard of living of others. So Abel decides to loan four fish to Baker and Charlie. Now we have fish to eat while we build our own nets. The nets are made. And they now catch enough fish to eat and to pay back their loan to Abel. Now, Abel has profited from his loan, and so have Baker and Charlie. I'm four fish richer. We own nets we didn't own before. Expansion Now, Baker and Charlie fish for a full week, saving enough fish to enable them to devote another week's effort on a still bigger capital project. This much larger project requires more and new materials, plus ingenuity. Let's build a bigger and better fish catcher. We'll need tougher stuff like vines and bamboo. The better fish trap. Our big trap catches fish continually. Outside of a few repairs now and then, we only have to gather the fish we want to eat each day plus some extras to save. Now we have plenty to eat and lots of leisure with savings to boot. We don't have a care in the world. Oh no? Huh? What do you know about the fish business, owl? I know plenty about disasters, chump. Natural disasters, acts of God. 
These may disrupt the island's economy by damaging its capital. The Big Fish Trap The flood has destroyed our trap. There go my savings. But when we find hard times, such as recession and depression, in the absence of natural disasters, their cause is man-made. Unnatural Disasters Throughout history, unnatural disasters have been caused by non-productive politicians meddling in the natural economic order to steal the productivity of some for the benefit of others. Let's take from the haves and give to the have-nots. Island Consumer Debt Suppose Baker and Charlie approached Abel for a vacation loan, instead of a loan for building nets. We're tired and need a rest. Loan us each two fish so we can bask on the beach a few days. It will cost you each two fish in interest. How will you repay? Uh, we'll work harder. And do without eating for several days. You'll have to go without eating four days to repay your loan. But we've just got to have a vacation. Look, why borrow and go hungry four days to repay the loan, when without borrowing, you can finance your vacation by going without fish for only two days? Give me one good reason. We want to take our vacation now! Yikes, the now-oriented generation. I deny your loan, which would only benefit me and be an economic burden to you. Besides, if I make a consumer loan to you, I won't have as much to loan out for productive purposes. Bah, fooey. Can Abel expand credit? Politicians and bankers frequently refer to expanding or easing of credit. But can anybody do this at command? Can a statist magician really make more wealth available to loan by a mere wave of his magic wand? Hocus pocus. The obvious answer is no. Nobody can loan out something they don't have. Any attempt to do so is trickery and fraud. Take this. I'll make good on it. Who are you kidding? You have only four fish in your basket. The island's total supply of credit is limited by its total supply of fish. The Emergency Loan for Consumption Abel has wisely rejected Baker and Charlie's request for a vacation consumption loan. And a week later, Baker and Charlie cannot fish because of a storm or sickness. Now, out of compassion, Abel makes a consumer loan out of his sacrificially accumulated savings so that Baker and Charlie can eat and live to work another day. Thanks, Abel. We'll work hard and scrimp and save to pay you back. But suppose Abel had granted the original and needless consumption loan for a vacation. Baker and Charlie squander the island's savings having fun on the beach. Easy come, easy go. And then a storm strikes. Who turned out the sun? Yikes, head for a cave. Hurry, it's a hurricane. The storm rages for days, making fishing impossible. Don't you have any more fish, Abel? Sorry, you wasted all the island's savings vacationing. In their weakened condition, disease could take over. Result? The island society could be totally wiped out, 
thanks to consumer debt. The Great Waster. Abel, R.I.P. Baker, R.I.P. Charlie, I never really liked you anyway, but R.I.P. Survival of the Savers. If, on the other hand, Abel refused to make the vacation loan, he would have had emergency funds available to weather the storm. We can get by on less because we're not using up energy working. We'll survive thanks to Abel's savings. A depression or a recession has set in. Yes, savings can mean the difference between the life and death of a society. Capital loan risk. Of course, not all investments or capital loans work out, and this can also bring about a reduction and a waste of society's store of savings. But the ones that work make up for the ones that don't. Abel may have made loans to Baker and Charlie to build nets, but... I'm a poor net maker. Where are all the fish today? Or... Abel may have used up his capital building more nets for himself, but... I can't find enough supplies! Ugh. Hey, I need this from my nest! Baker and Charlie irrationally refuse to rent my nets. Government programs encouraging loans to poor quality and high-risk applicants develop a higher degree of capital failure and waste society's savings in the same way as granting consumer credit. Go ahead, loan to those poor risks. I'll guarantee the loans. But government has no savings. It can only raid the savings of those who have sacrificially under-consumed to create savings. Enter the bully. Dun, dun, dun. But now let us suppose that while Baker and Charlie were attempting to negotiate a consumer loan from Abel for a vacation, Franklin D., the island's bully, showed up. What's up, chums? Aw, Abel won't make a vacation loan to us. He's stingy. <laughs> He's greedy. He's denying us a much-needed vacation. <laughs> why, you tightwad. You've got four fish you don't need. So why don't you loan them to these guys? Anybody else need a loan? My savings really aren't safe anymore. Not with that bully around. After this, I'm not going to work so hard, nor sacrifice as much to save. What's the use? Today, in America, the influence of politicians on loaning institutions operates in much the same way as Franklin D. To, one, waste savings by encouraging the uneconomic use of credit. Two, discourage savings by reducing, if not completely eliminating, the rewards of thrift. The island economy grows. Now let's see how the same economic rules that operate in a simple economic society also apply to a more complicated one. Abel's willingness to create capital through his own personal sacrifice has benefited many other islanders. Now there are many Abels fishing with their own nets. But not everybody has the skills of net making and fishing. Some islanders borrow fish to sustain themselves while they build the tools of other trades. I'll make tables and chairs. I'm a hammock maker. There's lots of need for wagons. Boat builders. Buggy builders. You name it. The islanders continued to use fish as a medium of exchange. All wages and prices were quoted in terms of so many fish, as were the terms of loans. And since each person on the island consumed one fish per day, the island's price structure was related to their daily consumption of fish. However, as the islanders' fish savings increased, 
they simply did not have the necessary storage facilities. Are you kidding? Burglars always look there first. And while they would have liked to see their savings grow by loans and investments, individual producers had neither the time nor training to judge the merits of business propositions offered to them. Martha, he's selling shares in the Cod Liver Oil sweepstakes. So an honest and wise member of the island community, Max Goodbank, seeing a very real business opportunity, enters the scene. I'll build a large storage facility for the island's fish savings. Just what we need! Er, but just how will it work? How Fish Savings and Loan Company Works When the ables of the island underconsume, they deposit their fish savings with Mr. Goodbank. Thanks, Mr. Able. Here's your receipt. Your deposit will earn interest without you doing a thing. Thanks. So the Ables delegate investment responsibility to Mr. Goodbank. Now, those requiring consumption goods, fish, in order to finance a capital project need only see Mr. Goodbank, rather than all of the Ables on the island. I need some fish to eat while I build the tool factory. Hmm. You have a good record. Mr. Goodbank has too much integrity to risk the Islanders' savings on vacation loans and the like. Sorry. Under his wise and conservative care, the island's savings and commerce continue to grow. Now, several generations have passed since the original I Am Able made his personal sacrifice, and created the island's first piece of capital equipment, a net. The island's economic and social progress began at that point. The island continued to develop and prosper with Mr. Goodbank's storage vault and his and his son's wise administration of loaning out society's capital. Investment decisions continued to be made by individuals. Let's put our fish in the bank. Loan decisions were made by Mr. Goodbank III. He looks just like his grandfather, doesn't he? Loan denied. Loan approved. Enter Manny Fund. But some investors wanted to take greater risks for potential greater rewards. Why don't you loan to the newly formed Sling Flight Company? If that venture really flies, we'll clean up. No, no, too risky. I won't chance it. Mr. Goodbank, true to form, will not invest in high-risk ventures. Ahem. I believe I can be of service, gents. Huh? Who are you? Manny Fund's the name. Pool your risk capital with me, and I'll invest those savings in higher risk ventures. Yeah, big profits coming, we hope. It'll be worth the risk. Hey, guys! So, while Mr. Goodbank continues to be entrusted with capital growth through more conservative forms of investment, Manny Fund invests for the risk takers. Hooray! Sling flight profits are soaring! But the Blub Marine Company went under. And so, the island's economy continues to grow to the benefit of all. The water supply problem. From the beginning, islanders drew their water from the mountain stream. So most people didn't live or work very far from the water supply. One year, a dreadful drought, a natural disaster, just about wiped out everybody. What could be done as insurance against such a thing in the future? The fertile mind of H2O Peddler tackled the problem. Hmm, in nature, rain runoff collects in ponds. Let's copy nature. Let's build a big reservoir to collect and save rainwater for future use. 
Mr. Goodbank had a receptive ear. And equally important, the island's savings were now great enough to fund such a large project. Then we'll construct a network of pipelines, etc. You've got a loan for your project, Mr. H2O Peddler. The Waterworks Project The Waterworks Project required an investment by the savers of the community of 547,500 fish, enough to support a crew of 250 men for two years while they labored. The risk was weighed against the success. The project, if successful, would pay for itself and ensure a better future for every islander. The splashing success of the Waterworks Project flowed through the island's economy. Pipelines, available for a reasonable charge, brought water great distances. This beats hiking up to Precipice Pond! Industry and workers could locate at points remote from the source of water. Irrigation made crop failures less likely. Relieved of the task of hauling water by hand, everybody now has more time and energy to devote to producing more consumer goods and developing new capital projects. The waterworks prospered and paid back its loan plus interest, so the island's savings capital grew and grew under Mr. Goodbank's watchful care. Quite a catch. The entire island economy blossoms, thanks to the capital invested in the waterworks. Big versus Little Economics To some islanders, it appears that the economics of prosperity and disaster have become different with bigness and complexity from those of a small economy. Wow, it's a whole new ball of wax, or box of gears. But this just isn't true. Basic economic principles do not change with the size of an economy. They're just harder to see because of more complicated agencies and terminology. Direct relationship between self-sacrifice, savings, credit, investment, economic incentive, social and economic progress is always the same. Similarly, the principles of math don't change with the size of the problems. It's still addition. Government on the island. Self-government was the bottom line. I mind my own. Everybody else do likewise. Or else. Settling disputes and crimes of passion had long been settled by the islanders in a very direct and personal manner. Come on, Pa. Uncle Ned. The varmint stole our hen. Go get him, boys. This contract is void. You can't do that, can you? Stick him up. Help, somebody, please. But seldom was there any help around. The islanders decided to elect a senate to select and oversee judges and a constabulary, whose purpose was to protect life, rights, and property. Let's elect 12 senators to do the job. Come on, everybody. Get out and vote. Hold it. Let's decide on a voluntary voting tax. Pay? To vote? How undemocratic. It should be free. Indeed? But if a vote costs nothing, it's worth nothing. The ignorant and irresponsible will vote if it's free, and such votes are dangerous. I like the way this candidate parts his hair. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. One's as good as another. In government, if you want a say, then you've got to pay. Okay. It'll help defray the costs of government, too. Let the stupid and who cares citizen stay home. If he pays to vote, he'll pay more attention to the issues and the candidates. Hold it. Mr. Goldsmith is rich. He should pay more to vote. 
Why is that? Rich and poor alike will receive the same benefits from government, protection of life, liberty, and property. Like going to the theater, the price is the same for everybody. Each person enjoys the same entertainment. Okay, you win again, Mr. Justice. Everybody should pay the same tax to vote. Huh? Look who's coming to vote. Oh, that's Sonny. Huh? You're too young to vote. What does age have to do with it? I work. I'm a productive member of society, and I'll pay the five fish tax to vote. Um, uh, you got me there, kid. On the other hand, that old hobo contributes zero to our society, and his judgment is questionable. <laughs> Why pay to vote? So I can have a say in what kind of men are elected. Five fish is a cheap price to pay for control of economic and social justice. Some of the islanders, of course, would not have given even one fish, let alone five, to promote economic and social justice. Fortunately, they did not have a voice in the island's government. Who cares? And so... With the enforcement of just laws and the court system enforcing contracts and disputes among tradesmen, trade was facilitated, and this further increased the division of labor, increasing economic benefits for all, taxpayers and non-taxpayers alike. The island's economy continued to grow, and everybody prospered. Democracy Rears Its Ugly Head a few more generations pass, and the political complexion of the island has changed. In a burst of democratic fervor, everyone on the island has been given the vote. Senators are now highly paid individuals who seek office more for money and power than for the honor of dispensing justice. Many of them spend small fortunes to get elected. Senators also pay their way into office by dispensing favors which win votes. Friends, welfareites, and favor seekers. Hey, what about me? Dispensing favors wins votes. Dispensing justice does not. By the new democratic thinkology. Such is the reality of political life on the island now. The courts. The courts still theoretically dispense justice, but the quality of justice has suffered because of the kind of judges the senators were now appointing. You're a good party man, Gorman Gavel. You're in. You can count on me, old buddy. Worse yet, the legitimate courts were replaced by a host of new administrative courts, set up by the Senate to administer a quagmire of new laws they had passed. These courts function outside the real legal system and are controlled by the Senate. What constitutional rights? Guilty! Prove you're innocent! The Senate now has more power and influence than was originally intended. Franklin D. V is chief senator now. He's a direct descendant of the island's original bully. He won re-election to the Senate time after time through the favors so many of them thought he did for them. But all that time, as a senator, he was doing favors for them with their own money and overcharging them to boot. Bless you and vote for me. Praise the Lord of the island. Note, Franklin's taxing arm is very big, but his favor arm is emaciated. Now, Franklin was always looking for new ways to bestow vote-getting favors to keep himself in office. Hmm, the new director of the bank, Seymour Goodbank, a direct descendant of Max Goodbank, the bank's founder is rejecting a number of requests for commercial and consumption loans. 
There must be a way to use these rejected loan applicants. Hmm. Sorry, I'm a conscientious guardian of the island's savings. Dingy! Bah! Tightwad. Franklin had a bureaucratic brainstorm. And the Senate passed a new law. Easy to get government loan. Low interest. Business, housing, school, farm, women, minorities. Now, just about every Tom, Drip, and Harry could get a government loan. And the senators had bought another big block of voters. But just whose fish money is being loaned out? You guessed it. Government loans really come from taxing society's producers, hence reducing what they can save and diminishing the island's limited supply of savings for sound investments. The government doesn't even possess a piggy bank of savings. Now that everyone votes, everyone also has to pay taxes. But most of government loans were made in a more sneaky and indirect way the government issued big batches of Franklin Reserve notes. All I need is paper and ink to make loans. Huh? What do we do with these pieces of paper? Why, just run down to the bank with your Franklin Reserve notes and turn them in for fish. Neat. Uh, What can I do? They made a law. Now... A saver's claim to fish he had worked for and deposited, as evidenced by his deposit book, was no better claim to his productivity than what could be drawn with Franklin Reserve notes. Work? No sweat, government loan. This is equality? Thus, the government provided producers and non-producers alike with the same democratic access to the community's store of savings. But no matter how you slice it, whether a man's property is taken by a thug or by a funny money scheme, it's still called theft. The only difference being that some thieves let the government do their dirty work for them. I let Big Brother do it. But eventually, even those who claim favors from government realize that government's bite is bigger than its benevolence. It takes a lot just to keep my machinery running. When the idea for a Franklin Reserve system was first proposed to Mr. Goodbank, he vigorously opposed it. And so the senators agreed to wield their credit power judiciously. Besides, the greedy voters and powerful Senate were an irresistible force, and the law passed. Pressure from above and pressure from below. But after the law was passed, It was soon amended to remove restrictive passages, and promises of government's responsible use of credit were soon forgotten. And so, at the end of the first year, a large volume of fish had been withdrawn from the bank by means of Franklin Reserve notes. This is disastrous! Instead of the savers having a profit this year, they've suffered a loss. Now I can return only nine fish for every ten put in. Huh? If the savers find out, they may withdraw their fish and quit using my bank. So Moneybags is out of business. So what? Who cares? Everybody should care, sir. The whole island is dependent upon savings. So, people will just save their fish at home, money bags. 
See here, Mr. Forgetful, that will put us back many years. There will be no pool of capital available to maintain the capital equipment we now rely on, much less capital for new projects. Goodbank was thinking of the waterworks, now greatly expanded to furnish water to the remotest corner of the island. The waterworks now employed 150 workers to maintain its system. It took 54,750 fish a year just to feed them. If savers quit saving fish at the bank, there would be no way to feed the waterworks workers. Then there are maintenance and repair costs. If all of the workers walked off the job to fish for a living again, the waterworks would finally quit working. And the island's entire economy would be in big trouble as people would have to relocate near accessible water again. Back to the old bucket toting again. Ugh. I haven't found a new job yet. I can't let that happen. Senator! Senator! Goodbank spills his troubles to Franklin. Once the savers on the island realize that they are losing their savings stored at my bank, they will stop saving. You will then see our whole economy collapse, like watching an earthquake in slow motion. Don't get so excited, Goodbank. Why should the savers have to know that their savings are shrinking and not growing? Why? It's now December. In a few weeks, I'll be giving all depositors their annual statements. Instead of having the usual 12 to 13 fish per 10 saved, each depositor will only have 8 or 9. Tut tut, good bank. We have the senator foresighted. We'll fix it so the savers can't tell they're coming out short. Bring on the fish technicians. Look. We've been collecting discarded fish skins and skeletal remains with head and tail. Now let's open up a genuine dried fish. Scalpel, fish glue, action! What is going on? They're taking some of the meat from the genuine dried fish and putting it around a skeleton and covering it with an old fish skin. And presto! What was once garbage, now looks like a genuine fish. Now we have two fish. Amazing. We'll use these official fish for money. And the depositors, the depositors will get wise. See, your official fish looks skimpy next to a genuine dried fish. Official fish need not be that small. We'll make five official ones out of every four real ones, so they'll only be 20% smaller. In addition, we'll pass a law to prevent islanders from comparing them to real fish. Yes, yes pass, pass a, a law. law! We'll say our scientists have discovered the dread pollute you disease in fish, and we'll require everyone to turn in their genuine fish for officially decontaminated fish. The decontamination process will help explain why official fish look a little funny. For society's protection, any islander caught storing, selling, or eating contaminated unofficial fish will be punished, fined, and imprisoned. Also, it'll be against the law for anyone but an official fisher to catch fish from the sea. You'll need lots of undamaged fish remains to make this operation work, Senator D. We'll merely pass another tax. In addition to his regular fish tax, each citizen will be required to pay a tax of 365 fish carcasses and skins per year. Why would citizens turn in their fish carcasses and skins in good condition? We'll tell them that to prevent pollution, all fish remains will be processed through our special disposal system, and that only remains in good condition can pass through our equipment. No one will get tax credit for remains turned in in poor carcass condition. But wait, 
In the long run, this won't work. Eventually, the real fish supply needed to support consumption requirements for capital replacement and growth will disappear. The whole economic structure of the island will collapse, pointed out Good Bank. We know, but it will work till after the next election. We can worry about it then. Meanwhile, good bank, this will give you enough official fish to pay this year's interest. One fish earned for every ten fish saved. This scheme will enable us to establish a great society. Well, Seymour, good bank, you will go along with all this, won't you? Absolutely no. It's fraud and deception. I was afraid of this. Great society indeed. It would be a great swindle. If there's one trait you senators have in common, it's dishonesty. I'll close the bank and tell the people to save their fish at home before I go along with- We've heard enough! Guards! Good Bank's parting words fall on deaf ears. Get Chesley Barton in here! Thieves! Murderers! Chesley, you're the new director of Fish Bank, er, under our supervision. Where's my rubber stamp, Senators? The next morning. Why, it's, it's Seymour Goodbank's body. Yes, and it's plain to see that he died of natural causes. Eulogies washed with crocodile tears are offered. We'll have a spectacular funeral. But how could the islanders have known that not only had they buried Good Bank, but the island's tradition for honest banking as well? Chesley Barton now executed Franklin D.'s scheme, and it worked. The transition from genuine fish to official fish was made. The islanders never suspected the dishonest relationship between their senators and the banker. But as time passed, many more Franklin Reserve notes were issued, so many more official fish had to be made from real ones. Official fish became smaller and smaller. Eventually, official fish were half the size of real fish. As a result, the islanders now consumed two fish a day instead of one. A double blue plate special, please. Prices, which had been geared to the islanders' daily fish consumption, were now double what they had been before Franklin Reserve notes had been introduced. Why are prices going up? Eh, inflation. Inflation's cause. Walter Hickel, a local fish merchant and the island's part-time economist, had a theory. Inflation is caused by a cost-price fish push. We can stimulate the economy by holding down price increases to about half a belly a year. The government bubbled over with explanations. Prices have gone up because we're so prosperous. You're demanding more and spending more. And you're wasteful. Why, you're consuming twice what your forefathers did. Inflation is merely the price of prosperity. But nobody thought of pointing a finger at government, the real cause of inflation. Since official fish were now so much smaller than normal fish, the government was forced to pass yet another law. We had better do something to prevent fishermen from noticing how large real fish are. I'm one step ahead of you on that one. We'll say that our scientists discover that fish taken directly from the sea emit harmful radiation. To protect their eyes, official fishermen will be required to wear these special fish glasses. This way, we can keep our scam going indefinitely. In addition, to assure the islanders that their fish were safe in the bank, the government created the FDIC, 
Fish Deposit Insurance Corporation. This law will show the public how concerned we are about their savings. Yeah, and if they think their savings are insured, they won't notice how they're shrinking. So the government and the bank continued to manufacture smaller and smaller official fish, and more and more Franklin Reserve notes were issued. Wages and prices, therefore, continued up, up, up. And by the time official fish were only a third the size of normal fish, prices were up 200% from what they had been prior to the circulation of Franklin Reserve notes. Now, yet another law controlling official fishermen was passed. They mustn't even touch real fish. The new fishing regulations prohibited fishermen from emptying their nets. Only government fishing coordinators could do that, to promote the general welfare. The fish disease is getting worse. We'll relieve you of your catch and pay you in Franklin Reserve notes. There's only enough immunity serum for us. <sighs> I guess so. It's the law. This way, only a small group of insiders actually touched real, big, normal fish. Why should we care? We've got good government jobs. The Senate doesn't want those dumb slobs to get wise to the official fish scam. But you can't fool all of the fishermen all the time. Some daring fishermen detected the fraud. Look, Fred, how fat and healthy a real fish is. It's much heavier than official fish, too. These lawbreakers withdrew their official fish savings from the bank. But, but, but think of the interest you'll lose. Ha, huh. your interest is smaller than the inflation rate. We'll do better to save these and our catches of genuine fish at home. More and more fishermen peaked and decided to keep the real fish they caught. It was a crime wave. Fewer real fish found their way into official channels, and a lively black market in real fish developed. The fishermen aren't bringing fish into port anymore. But there's a lot of fishy business going on, Senator. This has got to stop. We'll send out swarms of search parties. Those lawbreakers found in possession of real fish were prosecuted. Caught you red snapper-handed, bony and clawed. Eek! Crime doesn't pay. But there were other legal ways around the anti-fish laws. Offshore banking of real fish became popular among fish-wise citizens. Deposit to the account of Abel III. How unpatriotic. We'll pass laws to stop these criminals. Laws, laws, laws! And so, the Foreign Fish Control Regulation, number 91-508, was passed by the Senate. All criminals, report your foreign deposits here. You can imagine how much outflow of fish this stopped. The Senate passed still more legislation, supposedly to apprehend criminals, and now islanders leaving the land to travel abroad are targeted. Halt! You can't take more than ten official fish out of the country. But it's our vacation. It's also our money. Eek! Now, now what's this beast doing? Huh, <laughs> that's Snort, our currency sniffer. 
Snort's snoot is trained to detect Franklin Reserve notes. You also cannot take more than ten of them out. But, but, but why? Because we want to nab smugglers and counterfeiters who deal in large sums. Gosh, we sure don't have much freedom anymore. Yes, people control is what it's all about. The politicians don't want honest citizens hedging against inflation by investing abroad. Holding a tight rein is the name of the game. As official fish got smaller and smaller, it made more economic sense for real producers to spend more time hiding one fish than catching seven real fish, which they were compelled to turn into the government for Franklin Reserve notes. Fewer and fewer fish were turned into the bank, and to Manny Fund, and so there was less and less available for capital loans. A loan for a new venture? Are you kidding? There's not even enough for loaning to the waterworks for upkeep. Then I can't build a new factory. Wages and prices are now 600% higher than they were before Franklin Reserve notes came into use. Since official fish were so small, it took seven of them to provide each islander with the same nutrition as one natural or real fish. Since fish deposited in the bank were losing value so quickly, islanders were encouraged to save less, while many simply discontinued saving completely. Fish had to be spent quickly to avoid losses due to increasing prices. Unemployment grew in all sectors of the economy, since there was now less savings available to industry to finance its capital needs. There's a lot of unrest among those slobs, Senator. Hmm. Those slobs are also voters. This is serious. So Senator D dipped into his think tank for a solution to the unemployment problem. Bingo! I've got another brainstorm! Unemployment insurance will save the day! Chesley, print up a pile of Franklin D notes. One for you, and two for me. Yes, that's it. We'll pay the unemployed voters with new notes. All we need is paper and ink. And the unemployed, bought voters, rushed down to the bank to redeem their Franklin D notes for what little is left of the dwindling deposits of official fish. Get to run on the bank! The vault was soon picked bare. We've got plenty of skeletons and empty fish skins, sir. Here, see what you can pick off these bones. But, but this is a ten fish note. What about me? Hey! Shall I warm up your think tank, Mr. Barton? No, no, there's no time for that now. All I need is one more piece of paper and some ink. And so... Closed. Bank holiday. Some holiday? No work! And no money. Chesley Barton made an end run over to the Senate building. The bank's out of both genuine and official fish, and the dumb slobs, I mean voters, are all out of joint. Ugh, my think tank only gives me a headache now. Let's call in our economic advisors. Here they are. 
Walter Hickel, and Paul Sibling. Good. Quick, what's your advice in the present economic crisis? Expand credit. Lower taxes. What? But credit's been expanding until there's nothing left to expand. And there's nothing left to pay taxes with. Can't you birds do any better than that? Huh? A chorus of discontent rising from the streets. We want jobs. We need money. Er, our economists are working on a new plan now, folks. Expand credit. Lower taxes. What's new about that? Bah, that's all the economics those birds know. Retire them to their cage on crackers and seeds. Expand credit. Lower taxes. The morally and monetarily bankrupt senators entered into a feudal debate. What are we going to do? What can we do? All we ever did was steal the people's store of savings to finance our various projects. And now there's no more savings to steal. But why don't we just create jobs for the unemployed? Remember the WDA project of good old Franklin D.? We employed lots of people washing away dirt, cleaning the rocks on the beach. Let's simply create jobs again. How dense can you get, Cassidy? Government creates nothing. All we ever did was steal the community's store of savings with taxes and Franklin Reserve notes and divide up the loot among the voters. After taking our own big chunk. Then how are we going to pay off all those bonds that we sold to the people, telling them to invest in the island? We can't. And the bonds we gave to the bank in exchange for Franklin Reserve notes we distributed. We can't pay for anything. Give us jobs. Give us money. But those stupid voters still believe in us. This is awful. Into your think tank, Franklin. Save the island with another Kong. No way, Jack. There are no more foxy fixes to pull off. All we're left with now is truth. And then, Franklin D. uttered the only honest words of his entire political career. Friends! Islanders, countrymen, I think the time has now come for all of us to start fishing, and quickly. You can be a prophet. Interference by vote-seeking politicians brings economic mayhem. Business cycles, recessions, depressions, and inflation are man-made, always predictable, always avoidable. Example. Government borrows and taxes to fund welfare programs. Productive workers are penalized by higher taxes, while unproductive individuals are rewarded with government aid. Not only do such programs reduce incentives for all, but they draw upon society's limited store of savings needed to create capital and provide jobs. Example, minimum wage law. Let's help the nation's youth by passing a minimum wage law. Yikes, that's pretty steep pay. My profit margin won't allow me to hire as many as I'd like to hire. Not at this high pay. So I'll only hire a few of the best qualified, most experienced, and hardest workers. I got fired. I never even got hired. Thus, the nation's youth is not helped. 
There is more unemployment, and production costs are likely higher. And that is how society gets ruined. If you'll notice, the Islanders were completely fine until they started electing senators, and then things just went downhill from there. I mean, it's true. That's what happened. I don't know why you're laughing at me. I hope you enjoyed the video.